Um, all right, so a couple of pieces. So let's see. So this is this little problem I gave you. I mentioned tangentially, but let's put it up here probably. So um, quick. Just wanted to think about. All right, so a parent has two children, and we know one of them is a girl born on a Tuesday. Okay, so let's, let's start again. I'm gonna, I'm gonna st I wanted to start back here. I'm on the wrong slide. So a parent has two children, right? So here's a simple question. What's the probability that both children are, are girls? That's a, so you know this fact. What's this? Quarter, right? Okay, so there are these four ways things could go. You have your first child and then the next one. And don't worry about twins <coughs> too much or something. Okay, so a parent has two children, and we know one of them is a girl, right? So what's the probability that both of them are girls? Let's just say it's going to be a, uh, you know, 50-50 to have a girl or a boy. A half? A half. You know one of them is a girl. Yeah. So in the first case, it's a uh, girl-girl. These are, these are the possible worlds, right? And this is the first, second child. Girl-boy, could have had a boy-girl, or a boy-boy. And so in the first world, this is a quarter, quarter, a quarter. In this world we're talking about now, we know at least one of we know one at least one of them is a girl, so you could be in this world now. See, even this is horrible, right? Even this is horrible. This is just to make you feel bad about probability. What's that? It's adjacent to that in terms of the upsettingness of the whole thing, but it's a different it's a different problem. It's a different problem. You know, you get the sort of right. There are five million three hundred twenty-one thousand two hundred four. Uh, matchsticks on the ground. Like we can do crazy things like that, but we can't. I mean, if we've our brains are in sort of, you know, we can have weird. But no one guesses the right answers to these to the further complications. All right, so it's what now? It's what now? It's a third, right? Because you can be in these three worlds. So this is the way to think about it. Um, <coughs> okay, so that's that one. Uh, so that's a quarter. That's a third. Good. So now we have a parent uh, who has two children, and we know one of them is a girl born on a Tuesday. <laughs> I was born on Tuesday. So what is the probability that both children are girls? Oh, really? Oh, but not the same month. <laughs> Mine are born a day apart, mm -hmm. which is interesting for birthdays. Yeah, so what's your intuition? How do you feel? You know, like if you want to put some money down on this? Like <coughs> so that Tuesday doesn't matter, right? No, I mean, no, it's reasonable. Uh, I mean, I could be tricking you and say, yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. So you know this is horrible. All right. But, th but naturally, right, if you walk up to this thing, you're like, well, it's still going to be a, a third, right? Yeah, so now you have to do something slightly different, right? Um, what about this one? Then? So we know one of them is a girl born on December 31st. So I want you to think about this, and then once you've, I want you to make it obvious when you get the right answer. Which is completely wrong, right? You're not allowed to do that. You c it can't be obvious. But I want you to see if you can come up with a, some sort of illustration, some sort of physical thing that you put in front of someone and say, oh, now I understand. Because th there's a calculation you can do, right? You can kind of set it up and do it algebraically. But that doesn't always add to your sense of things. Um, okay, so what are the same thing? Um, but the intuition is still a third, right? Okay. So should we just leave it there? I think we could just leave it there. You have to start thinking about now you've got days of the week involved, and you want to see if that matters. All right, we're just going to leave it there. But it's horrible, right? I mean, I think this, this became, this is not actually a really old one. I think this was, you know, someone piped up at a conference and said, okay, all you smart people, here's something, whatever I figured out. Or it, 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 you know, this, you can imagine this kind of came out of some messing around with thinking about things, maybe an accident. Uh, and then, and everyone's like, oh, it was a, it's a third. So that's totally wrong. Yeah. It's sort of an artifact of just our imprecise language, though. Because if you were to use well, that's a good question. Is that what it is? So how do you make it clearer? The cases in which 
Yeah, it's kind of spelled it out, but in English you just say, um, and when you say the book or girl, or well, one of them is a girl, so. If you can come up with a way to frame it, to, uh, to, to, to naturally, as you ask questions about prob probabilistic things, a way of forcing yourself to speak in the right way that helps you, then that would be great. Because just running around, humans don't... I mean, we have good... You know, we, we do reasonable things with probability, right? I mean, we, 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 have, a, we have hunches and guesses and so on. And, um, you know, you know the fastball is coming. Whatever it is, right? You know, we have... We have there are some realms of statistical stuff that we do quite well in, but I don't know. This just blows our minds up. All right, so okay, so where are we? All right, now I'm going to get into these um, complex networks models. A couple of classic models. Uh, these things came out. I've mentioned this in '98, '99. They're still going in various different ways, right? I mean, apart from the academic work, there have been many implications moving out into the real world. I mean, they're about real things, but um, there have been some ramifications in unexpected ways. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to devote a little bit of time to generalized random networks to start with, right? So you've looked at pure random networks, Erdős Reni ones, uh, and then we'll talk about small world networks. So these are the big two, uh, and scale free networks. Right. Okay, good. So um <coughs> this is our lineup, all right? So we're going to have this thing in here. We're going to get to generalized affiliation networks. Um, there's going to be a couple of different origins here. There's um, uh, uh, Albert and Raker Albert and, and Barabasi's model, Kripivsky and Redner, Sid Redner at BU did some very nice things. So we'll, we'll get into that. All right. Um, <coughs> okay. So in general, there are, uh, mo these are models that are important to at least academics and in a few of these cases to everyone in the real world. So um, there's one that I'm not going to really discuss. It's so-called P-star models. These are well regarded in the social networks literature. You'll, there's a ton of work. It's more allied to graph theory. Um, I will say they sound good because they're generative, right? So this word generative sounds like there's something organic they're being made. But in fact, you're kind of making a weird black box that produces networks like the one you're seeing, which is what we'll do for this. But um, so when it has funny dials on the side that you don't know, you can't measure them um, in a natural way. So for instance, the statistical mechanical problems where we talk about magnetism or something like that, and you have your Ising model. There's a temperature, right? Temperature is something you can go and measure. Or for fluids, viscosity. You measure the viscosity of honey, of water, of air, and then you put it into your equations, right? So we have a, and you do that independently, and it's a small scale thing. Uh, these create n uh, dials on the side. For instance, like what's probably that your two friends are friends, right? Which you've looked at in this m most recent problem set. Um, your triadic closure, sometimes it's called that. Then you know, that might be a dial. There might be simply the average degree and so on. So these are things, they're kind of biases, right? So you end up with a black box that kind of has these knobs on the side, but you can't go out and really measure them in a natural way. So I'm just going to discount them completely. All right. Upsetting. Uh, yeah. We, the, the, we want ones that, and in particular, it's these ones are a good example of a growing mechanism. We've talked about them. They're going to, you know, uh, in the Simon models, situation we have to talk about again. It's a huge story. Uh, these ones don't have a generative mechanism, but they just have, the small world ones have, have uh, sort of opened up so much um, work uh, that, that we, you know, big deal. We have to look at them. So it's a different class. All right, so generalized random networks. These are sometimes called the, um, you know, different kinds of things, but generalized, this is what I call them, generalized random networks. So we fix the degree distribution. I've mentioned this you, maybe you have a real network and you're interested in what are its properties. You take out the degree distribution and then you say, okay, let's have that and we'll shuffle things around and then we'll create a whole bunch of networks that look like it and find the things about this network that are different. So that's the motif story, for example. Uriel Lund's work was exactly about that. Um, so now instead of, so when we made random networks, as you've seen in this problem set, we take a bunch of nodes and then we throw edges down. And there are a couple of different ways, right? One is simply to say, with probably P, there's an edge between these two nodes, and you do that for every pair. Or you have M edges, and you, th you throw them down in a random way. Right? You can specify like that. Um, that will always give you a plus on degree distribution if things are sufficiently large. Right? Always gives you that. So 
you can never get you know, many, most of the real networks that we see. They don't have Poisson degree distributions. All right, so we're going to force that from the start. And I'll show you how, how we'll do that. Um, so essentially, you have a distribution of degree. You choose from it in your funny way, right? So maybe, OK, we're going to, OK, there's a node with 10 friends. I'm going to put it over here. And the next one's going to have five friends. And the next one, right? There's going to be some, some distribution. We'll end up with some pile of nodes with different degrees. There might be tons of nodes that have one friend and right, whatever it is. And then we have to start wiring them up like a tinker toy sort of thing from a thousand years ago. You probably don't know what those things are. But um, you have to start uh, connecting these edges. And we'll do it randomly. We have to be careful about that. And we can create a whole ensemble of these networks. We wire them all up, pull them all apart, wire them all up, pull them all apart, wire them all up. And they all have the same degree distribution. And then we look at this randomness thing. So here's an example of it. <coughs> so um, you know, maybe we have these five types, right? Uh, these characters with no friends, one friend, three, four, five. And then we have some batch of them. We sample from our distribution. We have a soup of these guys. And we're going to start then, we call these things stubs after. That's generally what they're called in the literature. So we're going to pick up this stub, and we'll randomly find another stub and connect them. And we'll keep doing that. <coughs> right? So we're going to randomly select stubs, not nodes. That's not the right thing to do. So if you pick these guys and then connect them, that's... Uh, that's going to lead to bad things. Say you have someone that has 100 friends, then you're going to, you know, uh, it'll end up not being connected enough, right? So if we're connecting, if we're picking by stubs, then we'll get into those 100 uh, edges and start connecting them. Very simple things. If you're doing this at home, you have to have an even number of stubs, otherwise one of them is hanging off um, because each stub is half of an edge. So makes sense. Uh, if you, but if you're creating it, you know, not from a real network and you're just making it out of nothing, then you have to be a little careful. Uh, you allow self-links to start with. You can find this, right? So you might end up with this. You might end up with a couple of double links. Um, what you do is you have to somehow then rewire them. And so this is a sneaky thing to do, actually. So how do you rewire a network so that you preserve the degree distribution? And I have to say, I figured out how to do this. And we thought, oh, well, that's not very good. And then, of course, it turns out like that was a good thing. Damn it. Um, so you don't want to change the degree of any node because the nodes, you know, they have labels. This is a degree six node. It must stay a degree six node. So here's, here's a natural thing to do. Pick up an edge wholesale, just pick it up, and then put it down here and over here. If you keep doing that, you'll end up with a, with a pure random network again. You'll end up with a plus on degree distribution. Make sense because we're just shuffling edges everywhere. So you can't, so you have to do something slightly sneakier than that. All right. Um, <coughs> that's what this is saying. So the simple solution is to then actually, instead of rewiring one, picking up one link and then throwing it down somewhere, you have to do two at once. You have to do two at once. Okay. So how does this work? So we find two, we randomly choose two edges in the network. And so we have now four nodes I1, I2, I3, and I4. These are two edges. We have to make sure that they're you know, not the same edge, or they're not dis you know, they're disjoint, they're not doing bad things. And what we're going to do is um, pick up one end. We'll ch randomly choose one end of each guy. And so say we pick up this end, we're going to switch it down here. And this one, maybe we pick this end, and we'll rewire it. So then we'll rewire it like this. So that means that, so if we look at this, this guy had four, had one, two, three, four, it still has four. Right, because it lost this end and this other end moved in. If you think about it, this is the simplest way of doing this. Um, this one just moved to here, so it stays at degree three. Uh, this guy uh, comes down, so in, and the one that's lost uh, gets added, so it stays at degree four, and this one stays at degree three. So you're preserving the degree distribution. It's a little, this is not, it's not obvious that this one creates something really weird, right? There might be some, and that was our problem, I guess, back in the day. This might be creating some other non-random structures as you do this repeatedly. The rewiring is what makes it weird. That's why we're doing the rewiring. So the problem is, um, if you just connect stubs, this is a very uh, odd thing, but if you just connect stubs, you can get, you don't actually evenly sample from all possible random networks with that degree distribution. So it's very natural to just connect stubs up at the start, these, right, and that feels good. But you can, and I don't know if I have a slide in here, but you can see that you don't quite get everything evenly. 
right? You want to make a box of all random networks that have exactly this de degree distribution, yeah. So you have to do this kind of shuffling to, to kind of clean up some of the problems. So one, of course, is the self loops and the double loops or triple loops. Cleans those things up. But once, you, once, you, once you've gotten rid of them and you purposefully find them and get rid of them, you start to do this and, um, okay, you can do that. So it's actually, you can think of this as being, there's a four cycle here. This is off, off, on, on, and you're rotating the four cycles. Think of it like that. You can imagine getting six cycles and doing the same thing, but that might have some other problems associated with it. But it would have to be on, off, on, off, on, off, right? And you go, shh. That would work too. So that's another nice way to think about this. Um, okay. So there's a rule of thumb here. You, um, you will randomize the network if you just keep doing this. And uh, you typically sort of 10 times the number of edges, right? So you, s you select uh, two edges over and over. It may be that you can't really you know, work these two, right? Because you've selected the same edge or they're joint, you know, they're, they connect to the same node. So that's going to be bad. So you, you know, it'll fail sometimes, depending on how, you know, how poorly mixed your, your network is, right? If it's a low entropy kind of network, it's a little special and fixed, you might not be able to do this much. But providing you have a decent, successful rate of being able to rewire, this is just sort of a rule of thumb for sorting things out. Okay, so there's more to this story, but we'll reserve that for our next course. Is that okay? So this is just something that's done a lot. It's a very nice thing to do. Degree distribution is the big story, generally speaking. Um, and, you know, so all these other pieces like assortativity or clustering and so on, you could just, you know, start doing some rewiring and see how, or motifs, of course, being the big example, see how your real network compares to um, a randomized version where you fix the degree distribution. On the other hand, if you want to make random networks with a particular degree distribution, this is the way to do it. So I have some ridiculous algorithms that I built over some time to do it. Um, you know, other people do. It's a, um, you know, very nice, very nice thing. Because it's hard to, well, it can be hard to build them. All right, we okay? Total excitement? Yep, psyched, okay. Anyway, they're good, healthy things, yeah. But they, so again, no generative mechanism, right? I mean, it's just, we're gonna make them. But it's a way of starting to get some insight into real networks. You know, what's special about this real network? Okay, so small world networks. So this is a, um, so has this died? Oh, it's so sad. All right. Batteries. Um, sorry. Uh, okay, so, okay, so let's think about small world networks. All right. And we have lots of motivations here, right? So social networks. Of course, as I said, we, we've been saying them for a while, you know, properly. I mean, we've, of course, been living in them and thinking about them forever, um, manipulating them, doing all sorts of things. So uh, we've talked about this a little bit. Very difficult problem is how do you measure the connections well? I mean, so there's measuring the connections and then saying, well, this is kind of a friendship. You know, NSA is doing all sorts of interesting things here, of course. Um, <coughs> quantifying things. Uh, so... We have this problem, right? So you have self-report, like who are your friends? You know, okay, that's tricky. Can be a bit sad for the people who do not get called friends by the others, you know, and that's really, that's actually really a thing, right? I mean, uh, you get people to rank each other and it doesn't match up, um, which is disappointing. Anyway, so uh, remote sensing is, of course, this big piece that's been added in the last 10 years, All right? Uh, so, you know, fundamental questions. And then people have been asking these for a long time. Maybe we can understand some of them much, you know, much better now. But uh, you know, so there are all these movements. How do they begin? How do they evolve? Um, you know, how do you arrange things to be solved well? I mean, we do it all the time, but how do you, how do you sort that out so that people are collectively working better? Um, of course, you know, we have collective problem solving now is in inherently a socio-technical thing. You have computers involved. Um, how does information, how does it, we talked about misinformation, how do things spread? This is social contagion. Um, yeah, you go, you know, this is stroking the white cat in your swivel chair, like, you know, for the greater good, right? This is kind of physicists running around saying, you know, I think I could make a better, better society. You know, that always ends badly. But you kind of see that this is, um, this is not even really a subtext in some of the papers. You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> we measured some stuff and it's kind of clear that, you know. Okay. 
if we redistributed things like this and so on, people would be much happier. You know. So hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, anyway, so let's see. Um, uh, and, and I've mentioned this, right? So people in computers, you know, doing crazy things. Google is, you know, just a spectacular example, actually. We tend to think of it as a cold algorithm, but it's really, uh, in, its, in its best, uh, you know, best functioning, it's really, of course, people that have made good links. Messed up now. Uh, play and crunch, or hunch and crunch. Hunch and crunch rhymes, and we like that. Um, play and crunch. We like to play. We like to make computers crunch things. Um, you know, what can we do? So this is sort of a, a very interesting realm of, Stuff we were talking about chess the other day and Go, right? So um, uh, people, uh, if you, so we're we're getting crushed in the whole chess thing now, right? It's just a little disappointing, but you know, um, of course there are evil people sitting behind their computers saying we, you know, we built the thing, right? So there's still people involved, but but if you give a grandmaster a, a laptop, then they can really do some damage, actually, right? So they they you add the you give them not you know you don't give them whatever it is, Deep Blue, or they do come up with some bad names now, right? What's the weather thing? Deep Thunder or something? Which just, it's not, just sounds like bad branding to me. Um, anyway, you don't need to give them a giant computing machine. It's just a, just a laptop with some stuff. And, and of course, they're pretty powerful. But that, that can uh, greatly enhance what people can do. So uh, lots of interesting things there. And, uh, so there's a, I mentioned this the other day, Kasparov playing uh, The World. This is may maybe 2000. And and there were some grandmasters involved on the other side, but basically people were just you know voting for moves, and it was pretty tight. It was a pretty tight game. Um, all right. Okay. So this is a tiny little piece. So uh, what what about the searchability of social networks? So there's a whole story here um, that we'll go through. Uh, and so writing out like this, so you have distant individuals. Can you? Um, and so it's, this is a distributed search process. Right, so it's not like you look them up on Google or phone books. There used to be these things called phone books. We just look them up, right? So you're not doing that. Uh, the, you don't, for some reason, you know, you're not connected to this person. Maybe you just know something about them, like they're a type of person you want to connect to. And you can imagine organizations, that's a very important. Like I want to know, I, I would love to talk to someone who knows about this problem. So how do you, you have to tell your friends and maybe superiors and so on, how do you express it, right? How do you, how do you get that? How do you find, how do you search for knowledge? And what if you need a group of people? That's really hard, right? So apparently, yes. And this is the, this is the, um, you know, the original experiment. There's a lot behind this even for going back further, right? There is just, there's just this saying, right? It's a small world, right? So you meet someone who turns out to you know, have some connection to you. And the saying that at least we have in the Western world, we say it's a small world. In Indonesia, I think, People tend to say it's a big world about certain things. So this is a confusing thing for them. Um, so Stanley Milgram. Stanley Milgram, who's most famous for zapping people, or no, for showing that other people will zap other people, right? So he's sort of, sort of a bad guy, but it's actually really the rest of us. <laughs> um, you can see all, you know, this is, this, is a, this is a book written about him by Fellow Blast, but uh, I think you, you can, there are YouTube videos you know, from the original experiments, right? Yeah, that have been put together. Yeah, and I think the f so in France a few years ago there was a there was a um, do you know about this? There was a a game show. Yeah, they did a very similar study to what shouldn't be done anymore. Well, you just can't do this, right? I mean, there's IRB, right? Your right. review boards that stop you from doing these sorts of things. Um, the game shows don't have to pass the IRB. Apparently, France did not know about this <laughs> <laughs> as well. So people were. Yeah, so the setup for this one was simply someone in another room. So you come in, there's a person in a white lab coat, right? This is the 60s. Maybe it was in the 50s, but it's the 60s. And, uh, uh, and they say, yeah, okay, we're going to do this experiment. You're going to answer questions. You're going to ask the questions. And then if they get them wrong, you're going to zap them a little bit, right? And that's what this, you know, this elaborate looking thing, which was all fake. But, uh, and the person in the white lab coat was the authority figure, right? So that, that was the test. Everything was fake except for the person pushing the buttons. You know, the person who's answering the questions had a whole list of answers they were going to give. And the, you know, the third question would be wrong. The screams, because they start screaming eventually because you're electrocuting them. All of that was choreographed. At some point, they stop. There's no noise coming from the other room, because you can't see them, right? So there's no noise coming from the other room. And then, and this vi you can see in the video, right? People say, well, should I keep going? <laughs> and the, and the, the guy, this is what you can't do anymore, right? So the guy in the lab coat's just like, please continue. That's why there's always, I mean, 
there are other much worse things that happen. But this is one example of why now you, there's always a you can leave at any point situation. Also the time. Right, so it's getting jacked up. Yeah, so the screams are getting louder. It says don't, yeah, fatal, like go, don't go past this level. And then you can, and you can go a few notches by. Now, some people left straight away. They're like, this is wrong, and just walked out. But a decent number of them were <laughs> happy to uh, oblige the uh, you know, character they've just met in a white lab coat. And um, apparently, apparently lead to the death of someone else. Anyway, okay. So he did a bunch of experiments, and these are, what's that? You get a lab coat tomorrow. <laughs> 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 All right, so that is the take-home message. Okay, good. So, um, so he did a lot of other experiments, of course, um, and they're often very inventive, right? I mean, maybe I said some of them. There was the one, uh, I don't know if this was, he had, he had uh, stu maybe a group of students, I think, stare up, right? So, and so, there's th so okay, so it's a, a street, I think it was in New York City. Um, they were camped up in an apartment, and they're looking down, and so the students would walk along and then look up in the, the air, right? And then count how many other people did it. And so what if two people look up in the air? So you have two, you know, fake looking up in the air things. Like how many more do you entrain? Because they're trying to test the, uh, you know, social. So, the the so that's different, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so in some ways these are the two big ones, the Stanford prison experiment. I mean, there are lots of so qualifications about that now. Yeah. There's so there's a lot of stuff now, but that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, maybe in France, but <laughs> but that was pretty serious. I mean, they arrested. They had a fake arrest. You know, the, the campus police it was Stanford, right? So they actually pretended to arrest the people who would end up. You know, I mean, they really went to some. Yeah. This is the story, right? And it's a small number, but you know. It, it did go wrong. I mean, it did go wrong in that situation. What's that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, it, it's, got a, it's a famous one in terms of showing bad things. Uh, so, and he did a note. There was another one where he got people, students to ask random people on the T in Boston to just get up if, if they could have their seat. Could I please have your seat? So you've got this young healthy pizza-eating graduate student say, can I please uh, have a seat? You know, they're not, they're not walking on crutches or, you know, apparently pregnant. So there's no story, you know, there's no reason. And, and testing out what would happen. What came back was the student saying, this is awful. This feels awful to do. And Milgram's like, apparently, who said, what is, what is wrong with you, you weak-minded fools? And, um, <laughs> and went out and tried to do it himself and I think had a similar experience. You know, it's, you know, Li lying, lying like, you know, certain kinds of lying is definitely hard, unless you're a sociopath, I suppose. So, um, but for him, it was easy to order someone else to do it, right? That's the social distancing story that, you know, that's the thing that matters, right? You know, so uh, that's, that's why very bad things can happen collectively. All right, so he did, you know, he's interested in this whole small world thing, and he thought, well, let's make an experiment. And, and this is the, and he made a number, and not all of them worked out that well, right? So this is the one that gets, got published. And, uh, <coughs> you, know, you know, so there are various caveats with it, but we'll see where it goes. So there's about 300 people uh, involved, and he enlisted them through, uh, you know, ads in the newspaper and various other kinds of things. Uh, a couple of hundred were actually in Omaha, and I can't remember what his connection was to Omaha. Maybe he was from there, I don't know. But uh, and 100 in Boston. So he was at... Harvard at the time. And the target person was a, um, just a, stock, a stockbroker who lived in Sharon, Mass, and just had this, I think they actually gave you the name of the person and their address. I mean, you really, so you were given all these things. And then the instructions were, you know, please don't send, send you know, connect to them. Please send, so you're, give, okay. so you're given a little kind of package, nice looking thing, it's kind of passporty looking thing. And Milgram was not allowed to use Harvard. Like, he wasn't allowed to say this was a Harvard thing or something. But he just put the address on the front. So it looked kind of good. It looked good. And then you, you were given the instructions. So you, the idea was to send this thing. You, you saw what the target person was. You had to send this in the mail. Actually, in the mail, right? You have to go to a post office. Uh, send in the mail to a person you thought was closer in some way to that stockbroker. So if you knew someone in Boston, you know, you'd send, and you're in Omaha. 
you'd send this off to them, say, for example. And if you're in Boston and you knew someone was a stockbroker, you'd send it off to them, right? You might have various reasons for doing it. But you just had to have a, you had to agree that you had a connection with that person. You knew them personally. So that was it. And then a very nice thing was that you, you were asked also to tear out a piece, um, you know, I think there was kind of a card, and say where you were sending it and send that to Milgram. So this is the sort of thing you'd have with a website, right? But you'd have, which we did, but um, that was the idea. You were sending, so, so all the failed ones, the ones that didn't work out, you actually had data on. So that's a useful thing. So that was clever. So it was well put together, as I said, didn't always work. So you'll hear the, you know, various terms of this is a small world phenomenon, six degrees of separation, which has an odd origin. I think it was a Hungarian um, poet or writer who, and I should put these in the slides properly, um, who just sort of supposed this in maybe 1910 or 15 or something like that, that thinking about the world, like, you know, you have a friend who's a friend who's a friend, you know, blah, 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 who could be the king of England or something like this, kind of just sort of for fun. To show that, just, just thinking about the size of things and so on. Uh, so, and that flew around, there was a play called Six Degrees of, uh, a, a John Guerre play in the 60s. It you was know, just sort of floating, kind of this ambient uh, idea that, you know, if you take everyone in the world and you go through their friendship paths, then everyone's on average connected to everyone else by around six degrees. So that was just totally made up. Totally made up. And the funny thing was that um, that's what Milgram found on average for this tiny little experiment. So it had a really nice connection into uh, this, yeah, the stories that were floating around in people's heads. Now, let's look at a few things. So 20% of them made it through, which is kind of spectacular, actually, because this is one message which just has to fail at any point. So remember, we've talked about exponential distributions arising from, yeah, OK, right. So it has to be p times p times p times a 1 minus p, then you're out. And the p for, for Milgram was 0.75, actually. So that's pretty good. That's really high. But it's still exponential decay, right? It's still going to drop off. Um, and this is, you know, I don't know, junk mail existed. This is the late 60s, but I don't think it was anything like it became. Um, I'll show you that we did the experiment again for, for email. Email, remember email? And um, uh, <laughs> before Twitter. Oh my God, it's before Facebook. That's unbelievable. So it was a terrible website, but we did it. Uh, and, and we were worried about spam at this point. You know. But spam had not taken off quite like it, like it did. Okay, so there's a lot of fun that people make up with this, right? So uh, enjoy. So uh, enjoy themselves with. So there's uh, full, oh well, Kevin Bacon. So there was this observation made, you know, in a magazine at some point that gee, Kevin Bacon's been in a lot of films, and and they're just sort of, you know, he's sort of adjacent to everyone in the film industry, uh, and then it became a thing. So it just became kind of a fun game. So you mentioned to you mention any actor, and, and then people have to, you know, it's like a knowledge of things, right? So uh, you have to see if you can connect them, if they just simply acted in the same film. Now, <laughs> you could make this much tougher by saying, well, they're in the same scene. That would be a more meaningful kind of thing, because presumably actors actually met each other. Although with green screens and animation films now, I suppose they could be anyway. But, but it would be more meaningful, right? Um, and so mathematicians were quietly enjoying themselves with their own little story, right? So Paul Eddish, um, who actually does appear in a movie, but not quite as many. Um, so we have the Eddish number, which is now it's papers, right? So which, which is a pretty meaningful connection generally, unless it's particle physics, maybe. It's still meaningful. It's just there might be you know, 300 people in the thing. So you might not know each other that well. Uh, but these were definitely meaning, meaningful connections. Um, there are a couple of things floating around, right? So you can. Yeah, OK, so, you, so there you go. So naturally, we must have the Eddish Bacon number, right? So these, there are links to all these, thi these things exist. Um, let, me, let me, OK, so uh, I can tell you a few things here. One is because this is fun. All right, there's the Eddish number. These are, right, so th then you have the strength of the ties, right? So these are the people with, this is how many papers they had together with Eddish. So this is pretty strong. So if you start to measure it in that way, you've got this. Um, let, me, um, let me make this thing work. OK. So do I want that one? 
yeah, this is not a, it's not a, this is an old website, I think. It's not a beautiful website, but you can put in, I don't know, whoever you want, right? Matt Damon. Oops. Yes. And then there are different links. I mean, this does give you some sense of just how, right? So here's the, here's the, um, right? You just, there are actually many ways to get between these two guys with two hops, right? But they've not been in the same movie together. But this gives you a sense of just what happens, right? The branching is crazy, right? So, and the, the, the actually, the, I think the initial one was Goodwill Hunting, right? So it was Goodwill Hunting, then it was Mini Driver, uh, who was in Kev, I can't remember which, what was she in? So, um, you know, I don't think, oh yeah, you can, you're right. Yeah, so now you can start comparing. And then of course people will look at the, the whole, you know, find who is actually central, right? And so there's, I don't know, I think it's Ron Steiger and a few other characters are really more central than, than Kevin Bacon. But, yeah, anyway, so that's good fun. Uh, maybe it's not good fun. Do they have non-famous people in movies? You mean, like, Seriously, extras or something? How far away Patrick Leahy is from? Was he in a movie? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, two degrees. His Irish number might be infinity, but there you go. Yeah, Bacon has been in a lot of films, which really helps. Yeah. Any more we want to try? But is that a meaningful connection, right? So, probably not. You know, and so, but it's only two steps. You know, so this is obviously just movies, but silly. But if you talk about, you know, you have a friend who's a friend, and then another friend, and you know. Obama is four steps away from you, or you know, the Queen of England is five. Does that mean anything? All right. That becomes the big question eventually. And can you find it? Can you, you know? Okay, so there's that one. There's, okay, and then there's uh, Bacon. This is fun. Uh, Edish number. That really, wow, that completion really went wrong if you saw what happened just there. Um, I typed ED instead of um, ERD. All right. Uh, let's see. So, pff, multiple issues. There's some trouble here. Uh, here are the people linked, right? So they, they're the, the, you know. Oh, look, it's even a sortable table. <laughs> Strogatz has done well. So Strogatz is a man. He's excited about this. We had some back and forth on Twitter about this, but um, this is from. Right. So this is a film, The Power of Six Degrees. There's a film about it now, right? This is a documentary. <laughs> So, <laughs> so actually in that, the, the Oracle one, you could actually select whether documentaries, or, you know, like various things are in or out. So you could kind of, you know, clean that up. So Natalie Portman is in there. Yeah, she, uh, she was at Harvard and wrote a paper. Right? Well, I think it's in, here you go, frontal lobe activation. I mean, that's it, right? It's not... Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> when is this? This is 2005, 2002? I mean, wasn't, wasn't she? You're right. <coughs> ah, that's interesting. <laughs> it's a fair call. Uh, where's, her, where's, where's her? 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. So it should be any of these, right? One of the graduate students who didn't quite <laughs> make it in. All right, we're going to have to test that out. They like that one because it sounds good. Um, her image was used in the here's a, here's a, so having one, one, either of these less than infinity is kind of impressive. So we, um, right, so Bacon's number is zero with himself. Uh, Bacon. Oracle. Yeah, let's do this one. So in fact, okay, so this person who's been through this course is actually in our group. And Kathy was actually in the Dominican Republic and got herself in a film. Like an actual real part. And um, uh, you know, Isabella Rossellini was in it. I mean, this is, a, this is an actual, this is a, like an actual film. Feast of the Goat. It's a Spanish film. Please don't do that. Oh, 
Okay, whatever. Go away. Uh, so she has a finite, uh, finite bacon. So there you go. That's so an, an saying is that if we get ourselves into any given movie, we get a Yeah, yeah, it'll be finite. Yeah. Family You'd have to work really hard to get one that's um, So that's it. She's a less than infinity. Now, do you want to do this? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, but if it ac happens accidentally. All right, so that's some fun. Here's some other stuff that's fun. Uh, there's a, there was a comment that came out of the NSA that said, we're, well, we're only looking at people who are three degrees away from, you know, if we find someone who's suspicious, we're only going to look three degrees away, right? Now, from a movie point of view, that's essentially anyone who's ever been in the movies. I mean, you know, I think it'd be kind of hard to find someone who's a long a number of steps away from Kevin Bacon now. Um, so there are many articles about this, but that was the statement that came out. It sounds really benign, right? So, well, we're only going to look at three steps. and like, okay, that can't be many people. But you can, you know, roughly argue that's basically all of the U.S. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know on average, you know, people aren't that far apart. But it's still theoretically necessary to capture all of a, you know... The universe, it is a social universe, yeah. So three is kind of a social universe. Now, but it depends how... Yeah. Everybody is a yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anything on the web. Yeah. Anything they can put into their big place in Utah. That's a fair game. Yeah. Which is probably email, right? But definitely phone calls. I mean, definitely phone calls. I mean, so, so then you have these different layers, so you start to put it together. Yeah. Um, Anyway, so it's interesting, you know, when you see these things out there. Six is a really big number. All right. Okay, so let's go back to this experiment. <coughs> and we'll have more on how this thing has been used, right? This kind of idea of search, social search, more practical stuff. You know, for really actually solving kind of fun problems, but then solving serious um, problems. So how do, you, how do you, you know, get a whole bunch of people to, how do you incentivize a whole bunch of people to do something like this, to search? Um, we'll certainly do it. I'll mention the Boston bombing, for instance, later on. You know, that's, that's an example where you know, lots of people are interacting. And we had Reddit, for example, kind of not getting things right, but, but kind of you know, figuring it out afterwards. You know. Compared to the, so it's interesting because they, well, we'll come back to it. But the, 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 general, the, the normal media, you know, the um, cable shows and so on, were pretty bad, <laughs> too. Uh, so... But they use this opportunity to say, look at all the social media, it's awful. It's really a bad thing. But the best way to follow that was through Twitter. And you can really, you, you actually could pick up some extraordinary details. All right, so this is a histogram of all the successful uh, chains that made their way through. And I know I'm taking too long. All right. Uh, there are a couple that actually made in two hops, which is pretty small. But these must have been in Boston. Uh, there are a few right at 11, which is really an enormous number of steps before, you know, that managed to not get killed, right? So, because you, if, if you were paying $10,000 to everyone to send their letter, they would do it, right? If you really said, okay, we really will give you $10,000. Um, I mean, some would not, but most people would do it. You, you have a completion rate of 99%. So then the thing might, you know, keep going like this, right? So there's a piece in here, which is there's some underlying search uh, kind of the you know, length distribution, and then on top of it is uh, the failure rate, right? which is cutting it off. So to say the average is 6.5, well, that's sort of a funny thing. It's the average of the successful ones. Okay. Um, so these small world things have two pieces to them, right? So there's the, the short paths have to exist because of this attrition rate, right? Things are going to die out. Um, you're not, you're not going to be able to search through it very well. And then the people are actually good at finding them. So the first small world stuff that I'll tell you about really actually focuses just on this, right? And this is the geometric piece. Um, but finding them is, al is an algorithmic question. So, and then incentivizing people to find them is also kind of an algorithmic thing. Right? OK, so these are the two pieces. Uh, so all right, so we ran an experiment. This, this was one front cover. It's trying to connect to India to somewhere in the US. Um, you know. This is actually the real website. The website where we ran the original experiment was terrible. This was sort of an upgrade. Uh, it was a horrible thing made out of Perl scripts and <laughs> MySQL databases that would collapse and explode, and I'd have to go in and make it work again on a Sunday. But it was just running on one terrible machine. 
anyway, so <coughs> Cold Small World. Yeah, so this is with my colleague Duncan. It's a while back. We got it published in Science, which gave it a, a bit of a, a thing. So it, it's got some interesting pieces in terms of social contagion as well, just with respect to the study. So there, we ended up having about 60, 000, about 100,000 people came to the site, which, as I said, was awful. You had to kind of put in your email address, and then it would send you a password. We'd make a password for you. It's from you know, 5 million years ago. You would never do this anymore. Um, and and there, were no, there was no reason to do this, right? It wasn't really an interesting thing. OK, so, um, and we gave you kind of nothing at the end. We just said thanks. OK, so we ended up with 18 targets spread around the world instead of just one. One of them was a professor, at, and I've mentioned him quite a bit in this course, as it turns out, right? So professor in Ivy League University, was at Cornell. Uh, we had some very interesting characters. So what we did was we, uh, four or five targets that we lined up to start with, and they were friends, or friends of friends. And then we said, on the website, we said, do you want to be a, you know, some part of this experiment as a target? And we got, a ta we got thousands and thousands of applications, and we chose these various characters. So there was an engineer in India, uh, there was a policeman in Western Australia, there was a potter in New Zealand, we had a librarian in Paris, there was a vet in the Norwegian army, <laughs> interesting characters. Um, so all these, you know, these people come and they're given one of these, they're actually given all these, they can sign up for all these targets, but you only get to send one message, right? So we weren't spamming away. Uh, of course, that's the way to combat this attrition problem. You know, let people send as many emails as you want, but then you might get hated, I don't know. Uh, we know with about 24,000 chains, right? So, not every, so some of these participants are, you know, in these chains. Um, which is a decent amount. I mean, this is a this is a fantastic scale for the times, you know, early 2000s, very early 2000s. And so we were very lucky. There was a there was a um, an article. So okay, to start with, we we got hold of this horrible little spider program that tried to find email addresses, which is kind of a wrong. So we tr we got all these email addresses and then sent sent out, you know, you know, please please uh, you know join this experiment thing, right? So it was nasty, hopeless sort of stuff. Uh, the thing claimed that it would get email addresses for people in Los Angeles or you know, Seattle, right? So you know, we set up a batch of sending out 10,000 emails to people who were in Seattle. You know. And I think about you know, a few percent were really actual you know, OK email addresses. Anyway, so this thing is just sort of you know, um, inching along. There are some you know, people are coming to the website, but it's not really a big thing. One of the, e someone at the, New so someone sends an email to uh, Sarah Milstein, who was a, a journalist at the New York Times, and there used to be this thing called the circuit section. So she thought it was interesting. She, she wrote about it. She called us up and she wrote about it. We are all at Columbia at the time. And so that was nice. We thought that was very nice. But this got picked up, actually. It was, you know, it was like the 15th page of this section. It was not a big deal. Um, just wrote about the experiment. And that actually got picked up and re uh, it spread, right? So this story was picked up and published in other papers around the world and online to some extent. Yeah, there was actually an internet by this point. Um, so things really, and then it just exploded, right? Then we didn't have to do anything. So we were very lucky, actually, to get this. Uh, and then it took off. So this is where we get these numbers from. Um, <coughs> all right, so this is to give you some idea. So we did have, so one of our students was from Russia and had a friend who was in Novosibirsk. It was a PhD student, so that was, that's, that's a hard person to get to. But actually, there was one example where there was a chain that went from London to Uganda, and then to Moscow, and then Novosibirsk. I mean, there were some weird patterns like that, right? So obviously, you know, the person in Uganda was some English character who'd gone, and you know, anyway. But that, right. There was one in Australia that was running around Australia, popped out to Canada, came back to Australia. You know, they're fun to look at. Um, yeah, you know, and we had some failure in our recording thing, so it was kind of bad. If you had you know a chain of length ten in it, we didn't record everything. Things blew up. Did you take into account at all that people wouldn't know that that's bad? Oh yeah, so that's absolutely that's hugely part of it. Yeah, there's no sense that they would be getting the shortest path. It's just like do the best you can, uh, and it's distributed. So people, of course, want to you know control the whole thing. So we got that sort of stuff, but it really was. You know, we were really up against it, right, because of this exponential failure. I don't think we, we didn't really appreciate that at the start, that we were, we were going to be lucky to get anything through. So we, and we didn't. We got about 400 were successful, right, out of those 20,000 chains. Um, but again, like, like uh, Milgram, we had a lot of data on the ones that failed, and we could see how they were, you know, inching towards things and so on. Our failure rate was much higher than 
than his two because it's just email. And, you know, we try to make it fun. We try to see, uh, we, we had a thing so you could track where, thi where your messages were going. Um, you know, if we had some sort of thing to get people more excited about it. So things like uh, find classmates started to appear, whatever that one was called. Was, this is before Facebook, right? So, and if we were smart, we would have invented Facebook. Anyway, so, because people loved this. They totally loved it. They wrote, you know, they said they really enjoyed doing this. You know, the social thing was really interesting. Um, and we're like, yeah, but we're just, you know. Anyway, um, <coughs> the one thing that did come out of this, and I'll come back to this later on, is, is this idea of, you know, collective search, right? That you could solve a lot of problems. Collective detective, you know, so that you could, um, you know, through these search processes, properly incentivized, you could do this. So that, that was sitting around, and we'll see how that uh, got picked up. So there was a fellow in Croatia. There was an unemployed student, uh, maybe a student, but unemployed in sitting in, uh, that was hard, in uh, Indonesia. That was really, really a tricky person to get to. Um, <coughs> a friend of mine in, in Melbourne who's a travel consultant. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, you know, it's the number of people that tried them, various things. This is the average path length to them for the ones that succeeded. So you can see they're all around four and five. So they're not that, you know, th so it's very much in keeping with this six, but there are many fewer successful ones. Um, so we'll deal with that. So this is our problem, right? So he had 75%, ours was 37, which is gigantic for an email thing, right? Normally it's 1%, and it's even less now. So if we wanted to get a chain of length 10, we'd get five in 100,000 would make it through right, with this kind of failure rate. So. We should have just at least done a double dot or something. You get to send two messages. That would have been much better. Anyway, so 1.6% uh, you know, of all chains got through. We lost a bunch because of our terrible code. <laughs> you know, so if there's, w I, I guess we had some random failure ourselves. So if we had a length seven one, there was, you know, our little P to the power, you know, right? We had a, we had a problem as well. Anyway, so this was a big deal. Uh, <coughs> What, what I'm going to present you with is this experiment, then theoretical work, because there's a, then a whole chain of theoretical work that, that went on, um, and, and also some of the you know, outcomes. Uh, so something we realized and we put in the paper is that motivation mattered, right? So the person that was very finable was the, um, the Ivy League professor, because many of the chains started in the US, naturally. So people could envision how that would work. And they would give up if they were presented, say, you know, you start in the US, they're presented with a, like some kid in Indonesia. That was just harder to see. So it, the people didn't try. And you could see that. You could see this motivation rate uh, issue. And if you just had, um, you know, even relatively small changes, because, again, it's this exponential thing. So if you, if you drop the, um, you know, the probability of, of this thing being completed down by 15%, um, <coughs> oh, this is the attrition rate, sorry, the other way around. So the attrition rate goes down, you know, this is just one example, then you could increase your, yeah, that's for one particular detail um, example, you, you know, your, your completion rate can go way up. So small changes matter. It's an exponential thing. Okay, so um, comparing successful to unsuccessful chains, uh, there are a couple, so one of the things we asked was, why did you connect to this person? And we actually asked also, people had to say, yes, I know this person, right? So you were, an email came to you, you would come to our website and say, click, yes, I know them, and then start your own process. Um, so we had that verification. So these are extremely close, very close, um, not close, right? And so this is a, the weak tie story. So this is uh, Mark Granovetter's uh, story. It's a very famous thing coming out of sociology um, in the 70s, and it's, it was about job searches, right? So people who were searching for jobs did better if they went for relatively weak ties in their networks. So you don't just ask your family, you start to ask people who you don't know so well, right? So it makes sense. It made complete sense for us too. Um, obviously, you know, these things are sometimes in retrospect, retrospect but these are the, uh, the, uh, the, the unsuccessful chains are here, the gray bars, and the unsuccessful ones are the white bars. So they're it's skewed out this way, right? So um, people, are, people were going just, you know, they were using, statistically quite clear, they were using weaker ties. So they're, they're sending the thing further. And if you've got this problem of attrition happening, then you need to move this thing along, right? 
Uh, they used, uh, so that's weak toe, that's granovetter. People used professional ties and the successful ones versus the unsuccessful ones, 34 to 13. Um, lots of the ties began with work in college. This is still, I mean, this work is still, you know, people are still trying to test this with the much richer data sets we have now. Um, the, uh, yeah. Okay, so this is something where people were, folk we asked them why they're sending, you know, what is it about the, the um, person you're sending to that makes you think you'll be, it'll be successful. And it was because of the target's work, for example, right? So they're getting, they're, narrow they're, they're zooming in, trying to get in through work. Um, they avoided hubs, so we'll get to hubs later on, but they didn't go for, that wasn't the first reason they could, I mean, definitely you would go to someone who has a bunch of friends, but this was not the primary reason. Um, uh, Milgram had come up with this idea of funnels because in his search thing there was only maybe three people around the target person that got all of the messages. Right? So there was this funneling, so was something he talked about. We didn't see that. Uh, so <coughs> lots of other pieces. But generally people zoom, they, they hone in on geography so you get it to the place and then you go in through work. Right? These were the kind of the clear patterns. And so this is something people are still kind of thinking about. Um, obviously, this is just a little gamified thing, but as I said, it will have implications. Uh, these things didn't matter. So it was more about the, the choices they made of the, the, uh, the person, you know, was, was, it wasn't about themselves, right? So, so you didn't have a lot of success. Uh, there wasn't a lot of variation in success depending on people's age or gender, right? So if you look at successful and unsuccessful chains, there wasn't a lot of variation. Um, I mean, that said, we can make a composite of the best senders and the poorest senders, but that's a bit silly, I suppose. But uh, and I, I, I may show it. Um, uh, <coughs> it didn't really matter where people started, how wealthy they were, their religion. It didn't, it didn't really matter too much of these things. Okay, so the completion rates for all these subpopulations are in between 30 and 40%. So, um, yeah, and this is a very contrived, silly thing to do. If you put if you put everyone, you know, if you took the very best of every category, right, then the, the best senders would be a Norwegian, a religious male who's in the 30-39, who's a geek, earns a lot of money, well educated, um, <coughs> and you know, uses weak ties to people they met in college, and then right, so it would be Italian for some reason. Uh, I mean, they just didn't comply. Uh, religious, blah blah blah. So this is a bit silly. Earning no money. This is almost awful for me to put that up. I should just get rid of that. Anyway, that's not, that's, that's kind of silly. These are, because um, it's, it's, it's misrepresentative of this, right? I mean, it really didn't vary that much. Okay. Um, these didn't, right, this is the hubs thing. Lots of friends. They're likely to continue to change. Pe people didn't choose these things. So they were really focusing on work and geography. This, they're really using information about the target. Um, <coughs> yeah, right? Using relevant information. Okay, good. So a couple, of a couple of things that came out, basic stuff. We had this average of four instead of six and a half. Um, and you can estimate the median, right? So you can say, all right, so I've got, I know what my failure rate is. And here's the distribution of success. I can kind of say, well, if they'd all gone through, I can't really say anything about here. Uh, if I'm getting you know, this number here and this is 10 steps out, then this must be five and a hundred thousandth of, of what was originally going to get through. Right? We use this attrition rate of 0.37 to kind of create a, um, you know, some hypothetical distribution of search chains. If they were giving $10,000 right, for every time they sent a link. So then there's failure. That brings all of this down. We can't say anything about here, so we can't really kind of figure out what the mean of this was. But we can get the median because we know how many started out. So the median is a solid thing to get to. So the median we can interpret as uh, we can estimate to be about five for countries that are uh, for um, chains that are um, that are within countries start and end within countries. Once we go across them, it's more like seven. So that's a bit that's harder. If you average all of them, you get seven. And if you do this with Milgram, you get nine. So that six and a half inflates out to nine or six-ish, depending on what the median was. It's actually much bigger, right? So the median number of chains, uh, median number of links in a, in, a in a hypothetical successful chain. So this is a big difference, right? If you compare these guys, we had nine to five, 
uh, that's, a, that's a big change. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, and this is a, be a good thing to finish with. Um, okay, so social, this is about social search, right? So information, you're sort of searching through informational spaces as well. Um, can we use this to actually do something good? Um, obviously evil is uh, you know, gonna be available as well. Um, <coughs> so you can think about what kind of algorithms you might have for, for informational search that could be inspired. You know, we have lots of bio-inspired computation. There's an element now of social, socio-inspired, right? Uh, so we have this incentives problem, okay? We, we know that's true for real search. Um, so what, what's it, so you might think, you know, what's a good way? We could just pay everyone who, you know, 10 bucks if they send a link. That's obviously gonna go to pieces, right? We thought about this, right? So we thought about people finding people that they've, you know, been missing. Because we got a couple of things. Okay, so we got a letter from a fellow in England whose brother had disappeared in Italy in the 50s, right? And he had a, a copy of the newspaper article rel relevant to it from that time. And he said, can you help me find, you know, can you help me find it? Someone wrote in an email, a woman who'd met a, some guy at a rugby match and wanted to know if you, we could find him. You know, we have this sort of list of people saying, oh, you know, this is, you know, can you help? Of course, Facebook appears and all these things. But so we're like, yeah, okay, well, I guess we could. Now, we're of course worried about stalkers, so you'd have to do something there. You'd have to kind of have some way of making it. I mean, that happens all the time anyway, but you'd have to have something smart there. But how do you pay people, right? We, we, we sort of had fun as our thing. That's how. Um, you know, maybe they become good searchers, so we let them do that, right? Okay, they might become super searchers, so let people just run amok and try to find things. Um, <coughs> and you want it to be non-gameable, so that's where it all goes wrong when you put money into the system. Right? Because if you're going to give everyone $10, they just start, they make a million accounts on machines all around the world, and you give them you know, $10 million because they made a... Yeah, and they just, yeah, it goes, bounces all over the place, right? Yeah. If you're really smart, you make your friends all of yourself, but all pretend friends or something, you know. So it could go horribly wrong. Um, you want people to get there fast, so maybe there's a game element. So that would, the ones that are zigzagging back and forth. Okay, so here's, let me finish with this. This is pretty great. So, um, 1969, the internet um, comes into existence. Pop, right? It's four nodes talking to each other, which is just a gigantic, you know, story. Uh, it was the ARPANET, so DARPA, right? All these characters. <coughs> so, it's originally funded by them, and they came up with this idea, let's have a grand challenge. Grand challenge of the fun, we'll make it a network challenge, in spite, you know, it's sort of a celebration. And it was, one day, uh, they put up 10 weather balloons, but not high up in the air, you know, like 15 feet in the air, they're tethered to the ground. They're just gonna be up from dawn to dusk, taken down, there's a little code on them, physically, right, you, which you can only see if you're right there. They put them up around the 48 states, and they said, six months before I think uh, the, it came out, find them. They're gonna be up for one day. You, you, if it takes you, you know, we're gonna take them down, if you, you know, like a week later you've, you've figured out through, you know, information percolating through the social networks, then fine. It's not just that day. Um, so they're eight foot balloons, so they're not huge. I mean, they're not, you know, you're not seeing these things from 10 miles you away. If you're nearby, yeah. And they knew it would be 48 states. So this is gonna be a hard thing to code up, you know, all possible, you know, 10, like some combinatorial disaster, right? Just like trying to feed it in. And the way they did it too is you would just feed in, you put in 10 lat long positions and it would just say no if you weren't right. Uh, <coughs> and the prize was $40,000, which isn't gigantic, but it was $40,000. So people, you know, martial teams, they build all sorts of algorithms and approaches and getting people on board beforehand. Um, and here's where they were, which gives you a sense that we're not worried about Canada. Right? Uh, <coughs> there were a couple that were obvious, like uh, Union Square, San Francisco, that a lot of people saw. There were some smaller places um, that weren't quite as big but there are lots of parks, right? And you had no idea, it didn't say, oh, this is the DARPA Grand Challenge on the side of it. You're just like, it's a blue. <laughs> so that's pretty tough. Um, so, okay. So I was actually down there a couple of days and I gave a talk a couple of days later. So I met some of these characters right then at that time. So it's the Media Lab, they won in less than nine hours. Uh, and so it's Galen Pickard and Riley Crane is a character here as well. Uh, but it, 
and, and so it was published a couple of years later. Time critical social mobilization becomes the frame for this. Like how do you how do you boom boom get things to work uh, for good or for fun in this case? Um, and so people were virally recruited, right? So this is this was the clever thing, and. You want people to find the balloons, obviously, you've got to do that, but you also want people to find other people who might help you find the balloons, and you want that to be recursive. So they did this. If you found a balloon and you submitted it, you, people made accounts on this website, and you submitted it, and later on, you know, if MIT wins, you get $2,000. If you were a person who found the person who found the balloon by you know, emailing to everyone, then you get 1000 and you get 500 if you were the person who found the person who found the balloon. So that keeps going, and you know how these things work. 2,000 plus 1,000, right? It's going to be, what's the sum? 4,000, right? So it's a little geometric sum. Uh, 4,000, so that's good. 10 times 4,000. Yeah, 10 times 4,000. This is assuming they win. Yeah, assuming they win. Yeah, Other, otherwise everyone's lost their, their time. So it's not a Ponzi scheme, which was the first question Colbert asked when these guys were on. Colbert, a few, uh, a few weeks later, um, there you can get the, uh, the, the, right, this is the highest level of um, achievement. There is the Nobel Prize and so on, but this is clearly, clearly where you want to be. So um, uh, one of those people who goes, gets on Colbert, Pinker, is going to be here today, right? Yeah. There's a talk at five, which you should go to. But Stephen Pinker? Yeah. On what? Uh, how the world is actually getting better. Like, we're killing each other much less. We have big outbreaks of doing it, but the numbers are going down. Okay. Anyway, so that's so this this is the thing. And in fact, um, so we have this. Um, you have clear incentives. You want to spread. So you want to email as many people, get them on board, like sign up for this thing, and you want to obviously want to find the balloons. Maybe it's gameable, but not too bad, right? It's not too bad. What's that? That's the point. Yeah. Um, but you could make more money for yourself by setting up a bunch of little shots. Like you find a red balloon and you go out and you say, okay, now you're going to invite yourself and invite yourself and invite yourself. But, you know. <laughs> yeah. So it would be a little tricky, but you're not, you're not going to make a billion dollars out of it. Right? Um, so there's a limit to how much damage that can be done. Right? Uh, so they only thought of a couple of days beforehand. They came across it. They only heard about it a couple of days beforehand. Like, oh, this looks interesting. And it turns out they, um, maybe I said this, uh, Crane writes to everyone in the media lab saying, has anyone heard anything about this? And like, does anyone ha know how to incentivize social search? And someone wrote back and they sent the, our, our paper, well, not the paper I've showed you, but another paper which is, on, which is in science about the small world, like a theory for it, uh, and we, where we point out the incentives are a real problem, right? And so, and so they figure out this great algorithm. Um, a number of, uh, so that was pretty disappointing for us. A number, there were a number of other teams that did well. If you look at the science paper, they look at the other algorithms. There were some that got actually got nine or eight correct. They actually, there was a bad thing that happened. One of the other teams tried to spoof them by sending in junk, sending in you know, bad information. <laughs> and they did one simple thing. They just said, if the IP address that this information is coming from is not close or even in the same state, to where they're saying the balloon is, just ignore it. And they just cleaned it all up. So there was badness. There was some bad behavior. <laughs> yeah. Um, OK. So that's great. That's a, that's a good place to stop. And then we'll get to uh, theory, which inspired that later on. 